الحمد للہ وسلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ وعلیٰ علی وصاب اجمعین اما آباد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم کن تم خیر امت نخریدت الناس تعمرون بالمعروف و تنہونا المنکر و تؤمنونا باللہ ربش علی صدری و یسل علی عمری وحل العقدت من لسان یفکو کولی اولکم آل دی ویورز آف آل دی فور سیٹلائٹ چینلز آف پیچ ٹی وی نیٹ ورک دی پیچ ٹی وی انگلش دی پیچ ٹی وی اردو دی پیچ ٹی وی بنگلہ اینڈ دی پیچ ٹی وی چائنیز ایز ویل ایز مائی فور سوشل میڈیا پلیٹ فارمس وچ آر دی فیس بک دی یو ٹیوب دی انسٹاگرام اینڈ دی ٹویٹر آئی ویلکم آل دی ویورز ود اسلامک گریٹنگز السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ می پیس مرسی اینڈ بلسنگز آف اللہ سبحانہ و تعالیٰ آف آر مائی ٹی گاڈ بی آن آل آف یو بفور آئی اسٹارٹ مائی شارٹ ٹاک آئی لائک ریمائنڈ یو دیٹ دس از دا تھرڈ سیشن آف دا رمضان سیریز رمضان اے ڈیٹ وی ڈاکٹر ذاکر وچ ہیز اے شارٹ ٹاک فالوڈ بائی دی اوپن کوشچن آف سیشن فاسٹنگ اے کوشچن یو کین آسک آن دا فیس بک آن دا یو ٹیوب آن دا ٹویٹر آن دا انسٹاگرام بٹ دا بیسٹ از آن دا واٹس اپ سیونٹی فائیو پرسینٹ آف دا کوشچن وڈ بی ریڈ فرام دا واٹس اپ اف یو ہیو اینی کوشچن ٹیکسٹ یور کوشچن ان بریف مینشن ان یور نیم دا سٹی اینڈ دا کنٹری آف ریسیڈنٹس ٹو دا واٹس اپ نمبر پلس سکس زیرو ڈبل ون ٹو سکس نائن فائیو تھری ایٹ نائن فائیو آئی ریپیٹ ٹیکسٹ یور کوشچن ان بریف وتھ یور نیم سٹی اینڈ کنٹری آف ریسیڈنٹس ٹو دا واٹس اپ نمبر پلس سکس زیرو ڈبل ون ٹو سکس نائن فائیو تھری ایٹ نائن فائیو دا ٹاپک آف دا شارٹ ٹاک ٹو ڈے از دا کامن ایرز میڈ بائی دا مسلمس ان دا منتھ آف رمضان آئی ہیو لسٹڈ فورٹی سکس کامن ایرز دیٹ دا مسلمس میک دیر آر مور دین دیٹ بٹ دیز آر دا مور کامن ونس and have divided it into seven categories i have not divided into order of most common to the least common but in seven different categories depending upon upon the severity the first category is the common errors which are against the obligatory fard of fasting and zakat ul fitr in this there are three common errors The first is that many of the Muslims, they do not do the niyah for the fast of Ramadan. For the first fast, for the fast in the month of Ramadan, making niyah the previous night is compulsory without which the fast is not valid. Previous night means just before the Fajr Adhan, that is the previous night or any time before that, making niyah is compulsory for the first fast of Ramadan. For the voluntary fast, it's not compulsory, it can be made later on also. The second common error is that many of the Muslims, even after they hear the Azan for the Fajr Salah, they continue eating and drinking, thinking the end of the Azan is the start of the fast. The moment you hear the Azan, the fast starts and eating or drinking after that nullifies the fast. The third is that many Muslims, They give Zakat ul-Fitr after the Eid Salah. Zakat ul-Fitr is normally given in the last couple of days of Ramadan before the Eid Salah. If it is given after the Eid Salah, it is normal charity and it means you have not done your obligation of giving Zakat ul-Fitr. The second category of the common errors are the common errors which contradict the Sunnah of fasting. Number one in this is that many of the Muslims, they neglect the suhoor or they delay the suhoor. Number two, sorry, they neglect the suhoor or they have a very early suhoor. Number two, that many of the Muslims, they delay breaking the fast. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that 
my umma will be on the straight path till they hasten in breaking the fast and delay in the suhoor the third common error is that many of the muslims they recite unauthentic dua during iftar the fourth is the most authentic dua that is mentioned of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is zaba zama wa abtalati uruku wa thabat al arj inshallah this means that the thirst is quenched and the veins are moistened and the reward is confirmed inshallah that means and we read in the hadith that the prophet said this dua after eating the date and drinking water because the meaning is the thirst is quenched many of the muslims they read this dua before opening the fast thinking this is the dua to open the fast this is the dua immediately after breaking the fast as per the meaning of this dua the fifth common error is the many muslims they eat excessively during iftar or during night or or during sahur eating excessively is not the sunnah of the prophet and the sixth and the last in this category is that many muslims they are not prepared mentally they are not prepared for the fast mentally being prepared for the fast is very important the third category of the common mistakes done by muslim during the month of ramadan is the common errors that contradict the sunnah of the ramadan and the first common error in this is that many of the muslims they neglect praying tarawih prayers tarawih is a sunnah muqaddah a very important sunnah and as far as possible all the muslims should pray this though it's not a fard it's sunnah muqaddah number 2 Many Muslims recite the Quran so fast rushing through the tarawih salah. In tarawih the Quran should be recited at moderate place or slow so that you have khushu in the salah and you understand the meaning and it benefits you. The third common mistake is that many of the Muslims they think that the Lailatul Qadr is fixed on the 27th of Ramadan. it is not fixed there are high chances that it can be on the 27th of ramadan night but to think it is fixed is completely wrong the fourth common error in this category is that many muslims they socialize excessively after tarawih salah the fifth common mistake is that many of the muslims they neglect doing dua supplication and istighfar ramadan is the month of forgiveness so you should do istighfar dua and supplication sixth if many of us do not recite the quran during ramadan it's important it's a sunnah to recite as much as quran as possible during the month of ramadan and the last in this category the seventh is people they waste time many of the muslims ramadan is a very important month we should try and grab every minute you can't afford to waste a single minute in the month of ramadan the fourth category of the common errors done by the muslims in the month of ramadan is <coughs> neglecting the faraid the obligatory duties and there are four in this category number one common error is that many of the muslims they miss the fajr salah they may have early sahur and they sleep and they miss the fajr salah which is haram number 2 they may miss other salah some of them do the sahur pray the fajr salah sleep and they get up just before asar or before iftar missing other any of the other fajr salah is also haram the third is that some of the muslims they don't give zakat even though it's due on is due on them any muslim who has a saving of more than the nisab level 85 grams of gold should give 2.5% of that excess wealth if it is there with him for more than one lunar year and the fourth and the last in this category is that many of the muslims give zakat but they don't calculate correctly 
and they look for excuses asking fatwas that okay I may not have to give zakat on this wealth and not on that wealth they give zakat but they don't calculate correctly every Muslim should be careful and calculate the zakat correctly if they give less it's a sin if they give more it's no harm so if you're in doubt give on give zakat on that thing it's better to give more it will be calculated in the normal charity but if you miss out on any of the fard zakat which you have to give it's a major sin the fifth category of the common errors made by the muslim in the month of ramadan is neglecting or uh, indulging in the prohibited acts and there are 12 acts which are common that Muslims indulge in the month of Ramadan and I, and I, I like to list them number one in this category is backbiting and scandal monging number two false speech and lying number three vulgar language number four abusive language number five gossiping number six false action number seven listening to music or listening to un-islamic songs number eight watching un-islamic movies or watching un-islamic television programs number nine reading un-islamic books or magazines number ten going to un-islamic sites number eleven is uh, number 11 is doing uh, spending excessively and being extravagant in the month of Ramadan always being extravagant is haram and number 12th is wasting food so these 12 are the common errors which fall in the category of indulging in prohibited acts and all of this haram so it's very high category the three categories which are highest amongst all the seven category is the first one doing errors in which are contrary to the obligatory rules of fasting and zakat number two neglecting the farais and this is the third category indulging in prohibited acts these three are the most serious all of them are either sin or major sins the sixth category is that common errors done due to the culture and tradition and there are 12 common errors in this category number one is that many Muslims they stay awake the full night and they sleep the complete day number two many of the Muslims they are lazy and they are tired and not attentive during the day during the month of Ramadan and this defeats the purpose of Ramadan and fasting number three is rumor mongering number four is wasting time in playing games or in fruitless activities just to pass and kill time depending upon the country like in the Indian subcontinent people play cricket some people some countries play card they play badminton they indulge in games and fruitless activity just to kill time the fifth common error in this category is that many Muslims they give extravagant and lavish iftar party just to show off number six many of the ladies they spend excessive time in the kitchen thus not having time for ibadah during the month of Ramadan number seven many Muslims they spend time in renovating their homes or their offices and not paying on the ibadah during the month of Ramadan number eight is that many of the Muslims they socialize excessively after Taraweeh number nine many Muslims they eat throughout the night number ten many of the Muslim they they keep awake and 
they keep loitering the full night. Eleventh is many of the Muslim, they spend time during night shopping and not paying attention on the ibadah. And the last and the twelfth in this category is that many of the Muslims, they neglect the last ten nights of Ramadan, which is very important, the Akhri Ashra, in which high chances of the Laylatul Qadr will come, and they pay importance to other things and they neglect the last ten nights. These were the 20, 12 common errors in the sixth category. And the last category and the seventh category is many of the Muslims, they avoid doing certain sunnah thinking it will break the fast. And there are two common errors in this category. Number one, that many of the Muslims do not use the miswak thinking that if they use the miswak, it will break the fast. And this is a misconception. The Prophet did miswak and the Sahabas did. It's a sunnah to the miswak normally and even during fasting. And the second one in this category is people do not sniff water while doing wudu. While doing wudu, sniffing water is important. During non-Ramdan, sniffing excessively is sunnah. During Ramdan, you should sniff but not excessively for fear that water may enter your throat. So during Ramdan, while doing wudu, sniffing water is important but don't do excessively. Many of the Muslims do not sniff at all thinking it will break their fast. So this was in short, total 46 common errors made by the Muslims in the month of Ramadan, divided into seven categories. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He keep you and me, all of us, away from all these 46 errors and all the other errors that are there. So that we can come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we make the most of the time in this month of Ramadan. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may we fast the full month of Ramadan and may He reward us, may He forgive all our sins and may He put all of us in Jannah. This is the end of the short talk. And Alhamdulillah, I took about 15 minutes for my talk. So Inshallah, we'll have more time for the question answer session. Before I repeat the number of the WhatsApp on which you text your questions, let me tell you, you can ask your question on the Facebook, on the YouTube, on the Instagram, on the Twitter. But the best is to ask on the WhatsApp with a clear message. It's much more easier to segregate and for me to reply. Let me tell you about the request we received in the first session and second session. In the first session, as I mentioned, that only on the WhatsApp we received more than 2,000 questions. On the second session, Alhamdulillah, we received more than 5,000 questions. Means 250% as compared to the first, 150% more. And imagine it's impossible to reply to 5,000 questions in one hour or one hour, 15 minutes or one and a half hour. On the Facebook, Alhamdulillah, in the first session we received about 2,600 comments of which 10% were questioned, more than 20,000 were questions. In the second session, we received more than 311,000 comments of which 20% were questions. That was 30,000 questions on the Facebook. And on the YouTube, we received a few thousand more questions. So all put together, the first session, we received more than 25,000 questions in the second of the Muslims and my non-Muslims who wished me salam and they prayed for me. I would like to wish all of them wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi barakatuh. May peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. I would like to say Ameen for all the duas you made for me. I like to say that many of them praise me much more which I don't deserve. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he not hold me responsible for the praises that you have done on me. And may he forgive you for not knowing my faults. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he make me better than what you think of me. I would like to literally answer each and every of the more than 65,000 questions we receive, but practically it's impossible. I would love to answer each and every. In the first session, we answered 13 questions with duplicate total 14. In the second, se in the second session, we answered 14 questions with the duplicate question total 19 questions. So we could only scratch the surface and satisfy maybe 14 plus 19. That's 33 people out of more than 65,000 questions asked. And the team 
which is keeping on scrutinizing all the questions and trying the level best. I just spoke to them early in the morning. That's maybe about seven, eight hours back. And they had scrutinized at least half of the questions. More than three and a half thousand questions have scrutinized and they passed a few hundred to me. And last session, I requested my wife to speak to one of the revert sisters by the name of Mary in USA. And she was very happy to hear my wife. And she tried to reply to whatever she can. I've decided that from today, inshallah, from amongst the thousands of questions which I have not asked, so far I've answered, that I have not answered, sorry. So far I have only answered 33 questions. There are more than 65,000 questions pending. After every session, I will pick up one question which has not been asked. And inshallah, I'll give a call to that person and speak for a few minutes. So this will be a bonus because I could not answer the thousands of questions. So one question I'll pick up and I'll dial the number on the WhatsApp and speak for a few minutes. So don't be shocked if today or in the next couple of days, before the next session, you receive a call from me. And inshallah, we will start the question answer session. Anyone who has questions can ask on the Facebook, on the Instagram, on the Twitter, as well as on the YouTube. But the best is to ask on the WhatsApp. You can text your question in brief, mentioning your name, your city, and the country of residence to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five. And I repeat, plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five. And now we start the session, the question on session, which is more interesting. And we have about one hour, six, seven minutes. And inshallah, we'll try our level best to cover as many as we can. The first question is, hello, myself. Aditya, I'm a Hindu. I want to convert to Islam. What is the procedure behind it? First of all, I want to be stable and get a job so that I do not face any problem if my family refuses to accept me. And Alhamdulillah, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, give you hidayah. And it seems that because you want a stable job so that you don't face any problem after, after accepting Islam, it means that you have done proper research and you have been convinced that Islam is the best religion to be followed and you want to accept Islam. I want to congratulate for that. But let me remind you that don't wait too long. Once you're convinced, don't wait and look for a job where you get a lot of money so that you can be stable. Okay, search for a job. But if you do not get, don't waste too much time because you do not know how long will you live. I do not know how long will I live. We don't know whether we live for 10 years more or we live for more number of years, or five years, or few months, or we don't know whether we live tomorrow also. So earlier the better since we have been convinced. Please see to it that do not delay. As soon as possible, accept it. And let me again confirm with you. I hope no one is forcing you to accept Islam. And I hope that no one is pressurizing you to accept Islam. Because forcing anyone to accept Islam or pressurizing is not allowed in Islam. And, and, and I hope no one is paying you money to accept Islam. As far as to accept Islam, the procedure is very simple. You only have to believe that there is one God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he has got no partners, he has got no associates, and there is no other God besides him, and there is no idol worship. And the second point is, believe that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God. If you believe in these two things, these two are the basic requirement for anyone to enter into the fold of Islam. There are many other things following the commandments given in the Quran by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and following the messenger, the hadith, but the most important are these two. And even if you believe in this in your heart, you're a Muslim, you don't have to say it in public or go, but preferable if you can recite this in Arabic. And I will say, and if you want, you can repeat it after me now or later on go to the YouTube see my video and repeat it I'm saying it in Arabic the same thing what I said in English I'll again translate it for anyone to accept Islam you have to believe what I said the two things and in Arabic 
the same thing is, and you can repeat after me, is Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu which means I bear witness that there is no God besides Allah and I bear witness that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is the servant, the messenger and the servant of Almighty God. And if you believe in this and you accept with your heart and you say it, you become a Muslim. It's very simple. My request to you, Brother Aditya, don't delay. As soon as possible, if you have convinced, please accept Islam. The second question posed is by Bishal Mani Tiwari from Nepal. I am a Sanatan Dharma follower. The question is, why do Muslim pilgrims practice Hindu rituals of shaving the heads, wearing long Indian white sari clothes, fasting upwas, circumambulating the idols Kaaba seven times, use the Hindu Lord Shiva crescent moon symbol, observe the moon as Hindus for the religious days, etc. These rituals were all alien to Arabs, Jews. So why do Muslims follow Hindu rituals? And this is a very important question. And the reply to this brother from Nepal is uh, Brother Bishal Manitiwari is that Almighty God has sent only one religion to be followed by all the human beings. And that religion is submitting your will to Almighty God. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent according to our beloved Prophet more than 125,000 messengers on the face of the earth. And there were several messages and revelations given and sent on the face of this earth. But by time, most of these messages and the revelations sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have been corrupted by the people due to passage of time. By name, four are mentioned in the Quran. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, and the last and final one, that is the Quran. There were many messengers sent, 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give the message of Almighty God to humankind. 25 are mentioned by name in the glorious Quran. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. All these messengers, they came and they brought the basic same message of Tawheed, believing in one God and believing in the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the question is that why are there similarities between Hinduism, certain rituals? You'll be shocked to know. There are similarities in Islam with all the major religions, whether it be Christianity, whether it be Judaism and other religions also. I've given a talk on similarities between Islam and Hinduism. I have not spoken much about the rituals and most of the rituals that you mentioned, I agree, almost all of them, except for one, all of them are common in Islam. But in my talk of more than one and a half or two hours, I spoke about the major pillars of Hinduism and Islam. And I spoke in the talk that both Hinduism and Islam, Hinduism and Islam, they believe in one God. They believe that God is only one without a second. Both these religions believe that idol worship is wrong. Hinduism and Islam both agree that the last and final messenger sent by Almighty God is Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Both the religion believe that if you have to pray, you have to do the sujood, that is sajda, and so on and so forth. Both the religion believe that having alcohol is prohibited. Both the religion believe that uh, gambling is prohibited. And so on and so forth. You can listen to my talk on similarities between Islam and Christianity. What you mentioned were mainly rituals. And these rituals that you mentioned were I like shaving the head and I do agree with you. It's common in both in pilgrimage of Hindus and Muslims, wearing long white sari clothes, talking about the ihram, fasting, circumambulating around the Kaaba, using Hindu Lord Shiva crescent symbol. This is not because crescent is not the symbol of Muslims, though they use their culture. But I agree with you that most of the rituals are common. Why? Because Almighty God, He sent the same religion. The basics were same. Later on, people 
started adding other things of their own and the scripture got corrupted, the religion got corrupted. Then Allah sent the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and reveal the last and final message that is the glorious Quran. This Alhamdulillah Quran is not adulterated. It is in its pure form. I always give a formula when the non-Muslims come and speak to me. I said let's come to a common formula. Let us agree, let us believe that one scripture at least is the word of God 100%. The Hindus will say I believe the Vedas are the word of God. The Christian will say, I believe the Bible is the word of God. The Muslim will say, I believe the Quran is the word of God. Let us agree to follow what is common in the scriptures. Because all of us believe their scripture is the word of God. So if what is common in all the scriptures, all will agree. There will not be any conflict. So let us agree to at least follow the common points in these scriptures. What is different, we can discuss tomorrow. And when we discuss and do a research, a comparative study, we come to know that all the major religions in the scriptures, whether it be the Hindu scriptures, the Veda, whether it be the Bible, the Christians, whether it be of the Jews, whether it be of the Muslims, the Quran, all the scriptures say there's one God. All the scriptures say that worshipping anyone besides the true God is wrong. All the scriptures say idol worship is wrong. All the major scriptures say, and they mention the name of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and they mention that he is the last and final messenger. All the scriptures say that you should do the sujood for praying. All the scriptures say that you should fast. All the scriptures say we should do charity. All the scriptures say that alcohol is prohibited. And so on and so forth. So let us agree to follow what is common. So if there are commonalities, it means that all of us agree. The same Creator Almighty God who has created all the human beings is the main source of the scriptures, but these scriptures have been changed due to passage of time, except the last and final message, the glorious Quran. All the messages brought by the messengers earlier were meant only for those people, except the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He brought the message for the whole of humanity. That is the reason my request to you is Brother Bishal, Brother Tiwari, that do more research. Hear my talk on similarities between Islam and Hinduism and you'll come to know that even Hinduism says that you have to submit your will to Almighty God. And submitting your will to Almighty God, if you say in Arabic, it is Islam and the person who submits his will in Arabic, we call him as a Muslim. So I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he give you hidayah so that you come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you accept the last and final message, the Quran and the religion of Islam. There are many other questions that have been have been sent to me. There are, there are many questions. I'm just trying to take a live question from either the Facebook. Uh, one question posed here is, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Ziyad. Ellen was Ellen. I'm from Saudi Arabia, Riyadh. My brother always eat when it's Father Adhan, does it cancel the fasting? And a similar question is already there in my data bank. I'll just join both the questions so that we can answer most of it. Uh, it is mentioned. Yes, there's a question asked by Ahmed, originally from Somalia, but living in New York. The Adhan for Fajr the Adhan for Fadr started while I was having food in my mouth. I rushed to the sink and started drinking water to cleanse my mouth and quench my thirst while the Adhan was taking place on the phone. Is my fasting valid? Please answer this question in detail if time permits you. May Allah reward you endlessly. I love you for the sake of Allah. I love you too for the sake of Allah. 
both these questions asking that once the father fajr adhan starts can you continue eating and i mentioned this that this is a common error done by muslims that even after fajr adhan start they continue eating thinking you can eat till the end of the fajr adhan the moment the fajr adhan starts that means the dawn has broken the day has started so it is prohibited for you to eat or drink once the day has started so if you are eating any food and the moment you hear the adhan you should spit out that food if you have any water you have to spit out that water you cannot gulp it down before the adhan no problem the moment you hear the adhan or the moment you know the time is up from your mobile phone when the time for the dawn is there you should stop if you continue your fast is nullified and your fast will not be valid because you have eaten during the daytime and that is not permitted so i request all the muslim that see to it you stop now today the mobile is available you can link your mobile to the satellite and be accurate to the second so see to it that you stop eating and drinking at least half a minute before a few seconds before or a minute before not too much early because the later you have your suhoor the musawwa so a few seconds before or half a minute or one minute it is the best and do not eat once you hear the adhan there are many people who are sending messages here brother abdul qadir from bhuyan he says assalam alaikum alaikum assalam brother abdul mirza farooq muhammad haj irfanuddin raqib hasan ashar habib abbas alex midor qara tore most of them saying salam walikum assalam to all of you they are praying for me may allah amin may allah accept your prayers there is rk khan munawwar hussain choudhry long live sayed badrul ash uh, arshad jaya chakrabarti assalam alaikum i am from nepal this is a non muslim sister seems to it like and walikum assalam to you sister from nepal uh farah raza jafar khan asif mohammed all of you walikum assalam thank you for your duas may allah accept it my duas to you also the next question is by anas sayed from saharanpur india can the intention of fasting be made on the first day of the whole month of ramadan or is it necessary to make an intention every day yes the intention of fasting can be made on the first night of ramadan not the first day the intention be made the night before so the first day is incorrect the first night yes you can make intention on the first night of the ramadan to keep fasting for all the days of ramadan it's valid or you can make every night or some nights if you make first night it's the best so that you you don't have to make it every time make the intention and after that also if you make every night before the day starts but making intention is a fard for the ramadan fast the next question is by sister shireen from johannesburg south africa in the present scenario of corona virus if the school gets opened should i send my son to school as he has a chest problem and he easily gets bronchitis need your advice i'm aware that most of the schools in most part of the world they are closed and maybe after a few weeks or a few months when the surge of the corona virus dies down when the hype goes down the schools will open she's asking a question that if her son has got bronchitis and chest problem should she send her child to school and as you may be aware that covid-19 that is corona virus disease 2019 or sars covid-2 the full form is severe acute respiratory syndrome corona virus 2 that mean this means it is a respiratory syndrome it affects the upper respiratory tract of the human beings and if those people who have upper respiratory tract already it's more chances they'll get affected and if they get affected it can be more fatal so if your son is having the disease it is preferable that he delays he should go a bit more late so that the surge and the cases is completely low and the curve of this 
corona virus covid 19 is flattened it's better i would advise you that you show him to a doctor in your city and check him up and check it, take the advice before sending your son to school the next question is by wahid khan can we perform friday prayers at home by forming a congregation of five men and this question is selected from the facebook a similar question that came on the whatsapp i'm i'm clubbing it together is by mohsin from sydney please tell us the rulings about praying juma at home or in private hall following social distancing in terms of minimum numbers and how our prophet peace be upon him prayed juma in similar situation like war traveling etc uh, would appreciate your answer as it's concerned as it's concerning to a lot of us with different options basically the question is that can we pray juma at home is five people sufficient the reply to this is that many of the different schools of thought have different rulings as far as the congregation juma is concerned some schools of thought say that there should be minimum 40 people congregation to pray the juma salah some schools of thought say it should be 19 minimum but as far as if you read the hadith of the prophet of the quran nowhere in the quran or nowhere in the hadith is the exact number mentioned minimum for a person for the congregation to be for the juma salah praying juma is fard but the congregation is not mentioned for normal congregation, there's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim that even two people make a congregation. But for the Juma, there is no specific hadith. But there is a hadith in Sunnah Abu Dawud, volume number two, hadith number 547, which says that our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that there will be at least three people amongst the believers who will continuously pray all the Farah as Salah in the mosque and will not be tempted by the Satan and the Muslims should join this Jama here there is no mention of Juma Salah but because it says three people will continuously pray and the other hadith says two are sufficient for a Jama and Salah according to Sheikh Muhammad Hassan Addadu and Sheikh Muhammad Hassan Addadu according to me is one of the most knowledgeable living Muslim scholars of Islam He's from Mauritania. Now he's uh, living in Turkey in Istanbul. And I know him very closely. I met him several times. And he is one of the most knowledgeable, according to me, amongst the living Islamic scholars. And he says that for Juma, minimum three people are required in congregation. And he quotes the same hadith of Sunnah number Daud, one number two, hadith number five, four, seven, that three people are there for the Juma. And he says that one of them should be the Imam. One can be the Mohazin and one the Muttadi. So minimum three people are required for praying the Juma Salah. What did the Prophet do? Yes, praying Juma, of course. You can pray Juma in the mosque and that's the preferred place. But if you're traveling, you can also pray Juma in an open place. And we see that in the Sira of the Sahabas and of the Prophet that you can pray. Now of the situation of the lockdown, because of COVID-19, most of the people have to stay at home there was fatwa given by many scholars including by Sheikh Muhammad Hassan Dadu that if the mosques have been closed down by the government and you cannot pray your salah then read your normal five times salah at home even two people are sufficient for the five times salah and for the Juma salah let there be three people the requirement for minimum requirement for Juma salah is there should be three adult Muslim males I repeat three adult Muslim males they can be children and ladies no problem but the minimum in the congregation should be three adult Muslim males one of them can be the Imam one can be the Muslim and the third person if there are minimum three they can be more and if one person gives the khutbah and does the requirement of a khutbah and leads the Salah then the Salah is accepted and it is in this situation Sheikh Muhammad Hassan Dadu said that if you cannot go to the to the mosque because of the lockdown, see to it that you don't miss this opportunity. Pray the Juma at home with at least three people's gathering. I hope that answers the question. There are many messages I'm getting on the Facebook from Irshad Sharik, from Muhammad Anwar Sadat, from Sohail Ranar, 
Rahel Ali Khan, Munawar Popre, James Maulana, Vishnu BMK, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh, he's from Bangalore, Elu Fati, may God bless you, Jadakallah, Munawar Abdul, Muhammad Jasim, Chand Ali, Momin Hassan, and I, all my salams to them, Abbas Sheikh, Ar Arkanum Oxfordian, Kamar Jahan, Aslam Soa, Alamgir Munna, all of them, Walikum Assalam, and may Allah accept uh, duas for me. We'll go to the next, next question. This question is from Basharat Wasim Bhai from Kashmir, India. He texts, Assalamu alaikum, Zakir sir. You said in Mumbai that you sleep only for three to three and a half hours. I am also sleeping as less as possible three to four hours a day. But the problem is that all the day I feel light-hearted, I feel drowsy and dizzy. So my question is that, do you also feel drowsy, dizzy, light-headed, light-headed, not light-hearted, sorry. So my question is that do you also feel drowsy, dizzy and lightheaded during the day and if, you, and if you also feel the same, then how do you overcome that? Lots of love from Kashmir. Thank you. The question is that yes, I do when I was in Bombay, I used to sleep on an average of three to three and a half hours, sometimes even two hours, two and a half hours, sometimes four hours, four and a half hours on average, three to three and a half hours. When I shifted to Malaysia, when I did Hirijara, to the beautiful country of Malaysia, I increased my sleep by about half an hour. Now I sleep about three and a half hours to four hours, sometimes two hours, two and a half hours, sometimes five hours, on average, three and a half to, to four hours. The question is that the person says that he feels dizzy, he feels lightheaded, he feels drowsy, and do I feel the same and how do I overcome? Alhamdulillah. Most of the time, I do not. Rarely once in a blue moon, maybe once in several months, I may feel, you know, maybe drowsy. But most of the time, alhamdulillah, I am fresh. But let me tell you as a medical doctor, the normal hours of sleep required for an average human being, adult human being, is eight hours. An average human being should sleep at least seven to eight hours. If he sleeps more than nine hours, it is excessive. If he sleeps less than six, uh, less than seven hours, it is less. So therefore, you should sleep between seven to nine hours. The best is between nine and eight hours sleep. And scientific research says that anyone who sleeps less than six hours a day cannot function normally. And I agree with that. So let me tell you that I request all the brothers and sisters that you sleep at least six to seven hours a day. This is the best. And it is good that you should sleep. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he has made the night for you to sleep. But let me tell you one more thing also. That most of the people who are successful, in whichever field, whether good, bad, ugly, all of them who are celebrities, good, bad, ugly, whether they are film stars, or whether they are businessmen, whether they are the richest billionaires, or whether they are good social workers, or whether they are good Islamic speakers, or religious speakers, all of them, most of them, almost all, they are very hard working and they sleep less. But this is a very small percentage, 0.0001%. Though there is nothing mentioned in the seerah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad who is the best example, about how many hours did he sleep. But when you see his routine, you can make a judgment that the Prophet, it's not possible for the Prophet to have slept for more than four and a half hours or five hours. So according to my study, he may have slept most of the time between three to four and a half, five hours. To sleep more than four and a half hours is difficult because it says that the Prophet prayed tahajjud, he prayed qayamul layl for one third of the night. And you know, so if you calculate all these things and then even if he sleeps early immediately after Isha having food, the time of sleep that are calculated depending upon the season can maximum stretch to about four to five and a half hours and minimum, you know, can be, you know, can be lesser than that. So I assume that the Prophet slept between three to four and a half hours. But please let me tell you, there is no seerah that mentions this. It is my own research. Prophet less, slept less. Because, you know, my wife always tells me that the Quran says that, you know, that the night has been made for you to sleep. So it is sunnah to sleep and you should sleep. 
but then I quote the verse of the Quran that blessed are those people and those who attain felicity in the Jannah, those who sacrifice their bed for the sake of Allah. Uh, so it is both. Of course, praying, sleeping is better. But if Allah has given you that capacity, as far as what I am concerned, it is nothing that I am unique. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has blessed me and has blessed all the human beings, whether Muslim or non Muslim, to make them function normally, even if they sleep less for five hours or four hours or three and a half hours. It is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And most of the top scholars and the fuqahas and you know, we know from the history that they slept very little. And I also sleep less. It is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you feel headache, please do not. It does more damage to your health than good. You may stay awake in the night and sleep less. The productivity of those hours that you are aware is 50% or 25%. Better sleep well, stay awake and do better productivity four times more than normal while you're sleeping, while you're feeling sleepy or twice. My request to you is please don't try and sleep less. It's better that you sleep. What's the requirement? If Allah has given you the capacity like what Allah has given to me and then you do, it's no problem. The next question asked is by Zahid Ahmed from Bihar, India. Kindly tell us in brief the daily routine of Dr. Sahib so we can also take lessons from it how to lead our lives. The question posed by Brother Zahid from Bihar. The best person to take lesson from is our beloved Prophet Muhammad. He is the best example. He, as the Quran says, that we have put him on the pinnacle of the highest standard of character. Surah Kalam, chapter number uh, 68, verse number 4, including Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, that he is the best example. As far as my routine is concerned, one of them was already answered in the earlier question that in Bombay I have to sleep for about three to three and a half hours on average, sometime less, sometime more. When I, did, when I came to Malaysia, I did Hijra, and I sleep on average about three and a half hours to four hours, including sometimes I do, uh, I sleep in the afternoon, which is a sunnah, but not every day, all put together on average about three and a half to four hours, sometimes two hours, sometimes two and a half hours, sometimes four hours, sometimes five hours, sometimes less sometimes more. The most important and the first for every Muslim in his daily routine is his salah. The first question that Allah will ask you on the day of judgment amongst your deed is about your salah. So every Muslim should first be very particular about his salah and see to it that he offers salah five times congregational in the mosque. Now, because of lockdown, if you cannot do and you pray at home in congregation, Allah will give you equal sawab, inshallah. Like when you're traveling and you don't pray because you're traveling in the mosque, because routinely you travel, because routinely you pray in the mosque, you get the sawab in the mosque. Unanimously, all the scholars say that praying salah in the mosque is fard. Some scholars like Imam, Ad, Imam Ad-Dhabi say that if you do not pray in the mosque in congregation without a valid reason, then it's the 65th major sin in Islam. So I've done a calculation that in Malaysia, I take the timing from the time I do my wudu. The moment I hear the adhan, I do the wudu and go wash. Then I walk to the mosque, which takes about five minutes, though it's in the same complex where I stay, but going down the lift, etc. Coming back takes five minutes, then praying sunnah in the mosque and then doing the dua for a few minutes and doing sunnah after the salah if it's there. On average, it takes about 40 minutes from the time I do my wudu, from the time I heard the adhan, from the time I come back. Some take about 35 minutes, some may take 45 minutes, on average 40 minutes. The five times salah put together, it comes to about 200 minutes. Then adding my salah to doha, which I normally pray after the sun is in between sun rising and sun at the highest point, that is the best. I pray four rakat salah to doha, though the Prophet said pray two rakat and as many times in two rakat as you can. The Prophet most of the time prayed four rakat, even I pray four rakat after the midpoint of sunrise and the sun at the highest point. And even the tahajjud, that's qayamul layl, put, all put together it comes to approximately, you know, the 200 minutes comes to, and plus adding the other minutes comes to about four to four and a half hours, about two hours, 
40 to 300 minutes with the taj etc so the most important activity of, activity of mind is the salah besides the far salah which are the 17 rakat two in the fajr four in the zohar four in the asar three in the maghrib and 17 plus 3 with the 20 I also offer the 12 rakat sunnat muqada that is the preferred recommended sunnah and that's total 12 rakat two after fajr uh, two before the fajr salah 2 plus 2, 4 rakat before the Zohar Salah, 2 rakat after Maghrib Salah, and 2 rakat after Isha. 12 Salah, 12 rakat total. And also pray the 10 rakat Sunnat Ghair Mokada. That is the 2 rakat after the Zohar Salah, 2 plus 2, 4 rakat before the Asar Salah, 2 rakat before the Maghrib Salah, and 2 rakat before the Isha Salah. All put together 10 rakat, all put together with the Far, the Vitar, and the Sunnat Mokada 50 rakat. Uh, sorry, uh, come to 42, then the Hajj the Qayyamul Layl, 8 rakat, I read 8 plus 3 put together, comes to 50 rakat, and 4 rakat is the Salat al Duha, 54. So normally, my routine in, in Malaysia is minimum, I pray 54 rakat. The first, the Sunnat al Mawqidah, and Sunnat al Ghair Mawqidah, 52. There may be additional Salah of Istikhara, sometimes of uh, Salah after the Wudu. There is Tehatul Masjid always. So on average, I pray 56 rakat. At least once a day, amongst the five times I go to mosque, once at least I pray Tehatul Masjid. So at least 56 rakat I, I pray. And sometimes much more. When I was in Bombay, I used to pray the Fars, the Witr, the Sunnita Mokadak every day. And sometimes Sunnita Gair Mokadak. Not always. Now, I always, and if I miss the Sunnita Gair Mokadak or the Sunnita Mokadak, I see to it that I pray as soon as possible. So it's my routine that I pray all. This is the most important part of my activity. I know I spend a lot of time. And this is the most important. I spend more time in Ibadah only of Salah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than sleeping. And then of course I read the Quran as per the requirement of my uh, of my research, of my talk, etc. And the Quranic verses that is there in the in the salah and and the dua. I do the morning, morning askar, and then I then in Bombay, removing all these things, I have to spend on average earlier about 17 hours a day. Used to be 15, but because I have to go on holiday also, counting only the working days, about 17 hours a day. And then removing the salad, etc. Pure would be about approximately approximately would be 15 hours. That's double. A normal worker spends about 10 hours removing salah, etc. 7 and a half to 8 hours. So I have to do pure work about 15 hours in the office. Towards the ending of my few years of my stay in Bombay, I used to make it a point that because when my parents got old, I used to see to it that, you know, I used to spend a lot of time doing dawa, half the time I was outside the country. When I was in the country, the last few years that I stayed in, in, in Bombay, maybe you know, in 2016, 15, 14, 13, I saw to it that I had my lunch almost all the days that I was in Bombay with my parents. So after praying my Zohar Salah, I had to go and spend time with my parents, with my mother and my father. May Allah grant Janita Firdos to my father and my mother, mashallah, now she's 88 years old. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give her health and lift her at a time which is the best for her. And I used to spend at least one and a half hour with them, having my lunch, speaking to them, because that the duty of a Muslim. So that time, then my time in the office became a bit one hour less, sort of 17 hours became 16 hours. Here, when I shifted to Malaysia, I increased half an hour of my time, as I told you, in, 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 the, in the sleep and increased approximately 45 minutes to one hour in my salah. My tajud became longer than before. Previously, I used to pray 95% time. Now it is 100% time, alhamdulillah. And God forbid if once in a blue moon, once in several months, if I get up late and pray the fajr, but no time for the tajud, I pray after the sunrise. That was what the Prophet did. And my time for salah increased by about 45 minutes to one hour. and and, and my sleep also increased a bit more. So about one and a half hour of my time went more in Salah 
and the other activities. But yet there, on an average, when I used to give approximately, approximately 14 hours a day, here on average I give 13 hours a day, removing the time for my meals. On average I take about 20 minutes for my meal. And sometimes when I'm reading the news article, it may extend for 40 minutes, but I put the balance time for my news articles. And most of my time is spent in the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on average, I spent approximately one hour for my family. Can be about one and a half hour. In Bombay, the average was a bit less. You know, during when vacation was a bit more, at the time less. Bombay on average was maybe about one hour, not counting the vacation, vacation. And I used to cover up my time when I used to go on outing for days together with the family. So there's a Venn diagram here because I'm operating from home. I give much more time than Bombay. Every day on average, you can say one and a half, at least an hour or two hours. But this is a Venn diagram. Most of it, more than 50% discussing the hour with my wife. I speak with my children on the phone. So I'm seeing to it that while doing my activities of Faraiz, that is even praying, even sleeping, having the meals, doing dawa, it's a Venn diagram. And people told me that while I was doing dawa, that if I marry, the dawa will become less. What I did, I married. Adaya was in the field of dawa. So after marriage, my time for dawa increased. Before marriage, maybe it was 9 to 10 hours. After marriage, my dawa time on average per day went to about 12 hours. And also give time to my wife and started the ladies' wing. So it was overlapping. Most of the guys we see that they neglect their families. I may not give every day a few hours, but every day maybe a few minutes, sometimes half an hour. But we see to it that with my family when I was in Bombay, and even now, when I was in India, we used to travel in India at least, at least three times outside Bombay in India and three times outside India, out of which at least once was Haram. Every Ramadan since the last 20 years, except the last couple of years and this year. For the last 20 years, Alhamdulillah, always the family spent about two weeks, about 11 to 12, 13 days in Makkah, then next followed by a week in Medina. This was routine, which unfortunately we can't do this year. And so it's a common time between. Many a time when we went abroad, it was together for a Dawa lecture tour. While me giving lecture, even my son gave lecture to the general public, and my wife and my daughter and my two daughters, Zikra and Rujda, they gave lectures exclusively to the ladies. So imagine we are going for a lecture tour, a dawa tour, and we are attending the conference or a lecture tour, maybe five days, six days, seven days. And most of the time we are involved in dawa. I giving lecture, my son also giving, my, my wife and my daughters giving, mashallah, and audiences, large number, mashallah, for the ladies normally, 1,000, 5,000, 4,000, mashallah. And sometimes, or many a times, we extend they stay in that country <coughs> for about two to three days and go to a resort and have exclusively 20 hours, 24 hours for the family. So on average, if you calculate besides doing dawa activities, the average per hour is much more than a couple of hours a day. Alhamdulillah. As far as my major activity is concerned, when I was in Bombay, I always have a habit of writing down where I spend my time. I even calculate how much time I take from my doorstep to the doorstep of the mosque and I know it exactly. I know the timing take. It's approximately three to five minutes depending upon the lift. Sometimes it comes on time and if it is ready for me, it will take three minutes. If it delayed, it may take four minutes. If it stops in between more number of times, it may take five minutes. I am very particular because time is very important. I don't want to even waste a single second, leave aside a single minute. So I have to make a chart and in Bombay, I know exactly that out of the hours that I have to spend, you know, remove like 17 hours in the office, removing the salad time and lunch time, about 15 hours, then became approximately 14 hours a day. One third of my time used to go uh, uh, to the PhD activity, the administration of the channel and the graphics and supervising, etc. One third of my time used to go for the school, which was a large portion on average about five hours a day and you know traveling for lecture towards approximately eight percent 
doing research, another few percent, other activities, one percent, and the full chart is there. When, when, I, when I shifted to Malaysia now, yet my striving is the same. Maybe I'm sleeping half an hour more, a little bit of more ibadah, but overall, in terms of percentage, it is close to what I was to do when I was in India, Bombay. Here in Bombay, my most of my activities was Dawa oriented, but it was more towards hardcore comparative religion. It's maybe more than 50%. When I shifted here, here it, I continued to dedicate my life for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the focus has a little bit shifted depending upon the requirements and demands. As far as hardcore comparative has a little bit reduced, but Dawa has continued. Alhamdulillah. It has gone more towards atheism, that's also Dawa, but comparative religion is less because now the sector of the atheism has become the largest in the world. It has outnumbered even the practicing Christian or the practicing Hindus or the practicing Jews. There are by names, yes, the Christians are the largest, but practicing is the small. Then we have, have diversified more into other activities and here after shifting to Malaysia after doing hijrah from India, I meet more Islamic scholars, mashallah, meeting more Dais, Malaysia is a hub. Many people keep on coming regularly and the interaction is much more. And amongst the direct activity, it has shifted more towards the social media. When I was in Bombay, I had to on an average give maybe half an hour a month to my Facebook, just giving guidelines, maybe six hours a year. And to my other Facebook and my other social media, another half an hour on the YouTube. So total one hour a month maybe 12 hours a year. When I shifted here and I wanted to increase on my social media activity, Alhamdulillah, initially I started giving four hours only for the Facebook, you know, maybe two years back and restructured the whole thing because of which Alhamdulillah today, the followers on my Facebook is more than 22.4 million. By the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by, by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is the largest following by any religious speaker in the world, whether Christian, Hindu, Muslim, Alhamdulillah. And I realized that once you concentrate and you give, it is more of knowledge based than before. You know, previously it was more, okay, take a verse of the Quran, put Zakir next photo and the likes used to come. But I made it more into knowledge based, you know, giving things more are important. I started the series of the major 70 major sins and giving the authentic hadith and other things. Now I'm in the midst of the series of the, the signs of the ends of the world. I finished the minor signs. After Ramadan, we will start the major signs. So more time was spent. And recently, about, about one and a half month back, we decided to launch. You know, after that, we had the YouTube. And I started giving more time for the YouTube. Then it became collectively YouTube and Facebook about four hours. And the YouTube, Alhamdulillah, was hardly 400,000 after I took over exactly one year back. One year, two weeks back, I took in April. Now, mashallah, the subscribers of the YouTube are more than 1.7 million. Alhamdulillah, we also got the gold button last year after we crossed the 1 million mark. And because of this, mashallah, the viewership on the social media increased. And since one and a half month back, we decided to even launch our Instagram, which we have recently launched just a few months before Ramadan. We launched the Instagram and we also launched the Twitter. We also have the Pinterest. So now we are on uh, five uh, social media platforms. That is the Facebook is there since 2013, since about six and a half years. The YouTube is in 2011 about nine years. The Pinterest is last year, about one year. Then we launched the Instagram and the Twitter. These two just hardly less than a month back. And the followers are increasing. So now most of my time is going more on the social media and less on the Peach TV because the social media is catching up and the followers are increasing. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may we do more dawah. And one of the new activities we started is the live show that we're doing. And this we started, I never used to come on, give live talks on the internet. Hardly maybe four that I can remember in my life, four or maximum five. Then it was Sheikh Yasir Qadi and then we started this session. Then it was with uh, Sheikh Muhammad Salah. And now, inshallah, we cannot open the doors completely, but we are doing twice a week in the month of Ramadan. After Ramadan, inshallah, will be at least once a week 
inshallah inshallah every saturday i have decided 11:30 malaysia time so that it's a prime time in the indian subcontinent which would be 9 o'clock in india 9:30 in bangladesh 8:30 in in uh, in pakistan and the gulf countries in saudi arabia it would uh, be 6:30 and and dubai 7:30 so this was in brief i am you know i am meeting more people than before i should meet in bombay i should meet hardly anyone because of the schedule and at that time it was you know we had a big staff of more than 500 people now we have less staff only two full time paid employees have in malaysia and three abroad and another few five or six managing the pitch tv is all put together somewhere close to 10 to 11 staff mashallah this was in brief you can go on for us in my activities what i'm involved and in, how i spend my time but the main thing is not about the results the results are in the hands of allah subhanahu wa taala what allah sees is your striving as i said earlier in my answers allah says in the quran in surah imran chapter 3 verse 160 if allah helps you none can overcome you if allah forsakes you who is there then who can help you so let the believers put their trust in allah subhanahu wa taala allah says in the quran in surah ankabut chapter 29 verse number 69 that if you strive in his pathways he will open up your paths if you strive in the way of allah subhanahu wa taala do jihad fi sabil allah he will open up your pathways so most important is striving in the way of allah irrespective of what you are doing i remember when i started islamic research foundation that is about uh, 29 years back you know my main activity was we used to print books for free distribution and i used to give talks so i want and we used to print in a cheap press so i used to check the covers and i used to distribute in four different categories you know best very good good and fair you know where the printing is not good the best quality we used to give to vips the very good quality we used to give it hand delivered people used to come and ask the good quality or the good people on the post and the fair quality general you know? so we used to ask to spend maybe quite a lot of time in selecting the covers now we i don't even spend a second on that because we're printing in the best of best of printing press and they do the uh, checking so you don't have to spend any minute then i st- started spending time in checking the videos that is it correct there are no islamic mistakes so whatever you do you do with sincerity and striving imagine in bombay when i used to give less than half an hour a month in facebook and then i started giving 4 hours a day that's equal to 120 hours with 240 times more because that time facebook was in my main activity main activity was peach tv today peach tv has is continuing the production has gone less so i started doing facebook oh, i will not say okay that time i used to give half an hour a month so now i'll give one hour a month no whatever time available then when youtube came i lessen the time on the facebook i give to youtube collectively for us now collectively i'm giving about 5 hours on all the social media put together then there is the research then there lecture so basic thing is striving is important striving is in your hands if you strive allah will give you success if you don't get success it's not allah's fault it's your fault that you have not strived correctly this was in brief inshallah i'm sorry for i tried to say just i've only scratched the surface said only few of the a few of my points <coughs> there is a question on the facebook that just came a few minutes back by nagina asgar according to you which is the best tafsir of the quran in arabic uh, the best to tafsir are uh, tafsir ibn qasir and of tabari tabari is more for uh, the scholars and for the general masses is ibn qasir and this has been translated into english and if you take the copy of darus salam it is the summarized version and what they have done because when uh, when ibn qasir gives his view he gives all the various views sometimes he may give his own view also sometimes he may not sometimes he may say which he agrees sometimes he may not so it may also be a view which is based on zaif hadith it may not be correct so in the summarized version what darus salam has done with the group of scholars they have removed those views which are based on zaif hadith 
and kept only the views which are based on authentic hadith. So it's better. It is in 10 volumes. If you can read Tafsir ibn Qasir, it is good, but the volume is. The other Tafsir out or say a translation with commentary is Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Abdullah Yusuf Ali, according to me, in English language, is one of the best, where he took more than 40 years of research and time to translate this Quran. I am aware there are many books written against the translation of Abdullah Yusuf Ali because it is the most popular. There are mistakes in the translation. All the translation done by human beings have to have mistake. It can come nowhere close to the original Arabic text of the Quran. But the best available amongst all the English language, according to me, is of Abdullah Yusuf Ali in the original. Ibn Qasir is in Arabic and then translated. Original into Arabic is, it has a variety of many things. It has got mistakes. I'm not saying it's not. If you read the revised version by Triple IT, it's better. And there are other translations like uh, Say International, which doesn't have much of commentary, but Abdullah Yusuf will have more commentary. There are various others, but these two are the ones which I, which I normally recommend. There are others which you have to be careful, like Muhammad Asad is very good, but he quotes a lot of Zamakshari. Some things are, everything is not correct, but he speaks more on the Loga, speaks more on logic. So Muhammad Asad is good. He was originally a Jew by the name of Lippard West. Very good in the pen, but there are certain things which are contradicting to the Sai Hadith, so you have to be careful. So I refer to many tafa from various translations, but the main is Abdul Safali. If you want to read on comparative religion, Abdul Majid Daryabadi is very good. It's in four volumes. It quotes a lot of from the Bible, from the Hindu scriptures. On comparative religion, Abdul Majid Daryabadi is good. If you want the modern English, it is uh, it is uh, Sai International, also T.B. Irving. You can refer to my talk on Al-Quran, should it be written understanding, we have given details of many of the English translations. Uh, the next question, we have another 15 minutes inshallah. Question number seven, seeking permission to earn from DZN, Dr. Zakir Naik's video on YouTube. Salam, Dr. Zakir Naik. I'm Hilal from Pakistan. Walaikum Assalam. I'm a big fan of you and I have learned so much from your videos on YouTube. I want to get permission to re-upload your videos on my YouTube channel so people will be benefited from those videos because your videos are full of knowledge and I want to get permission to earn money from that on YouTube. Please, sir, give me permission. Thank you. Basically, the brother from Pakistan has asked a question that can he up upload my YouTube videos and can he earn from it? Basically, all my material, whether the books, whether the booklets, whether the videos have got no copyright, you are most welcome. You only tell them, don't edit it. Don't add your own into it. So if anyone uploads my, my video on his YouTube, there's no problem at all. What some people do is that when I upload on my uh, channel, you know, maybe in a few days it reaches about 500,000. What they do, they take the same video for my channel and then they may add something with it, with a photograph of an actress. Dr. Zakir Naik speaks on Aishwarya Rai. Now, who's Aishwarya I did not know. I googled, googled up and came to know she's an actress. I did not speak. What they do to attract people, so my video reaches 500,000 in few days, they upload it later on, they reaches a million. Anyway, doing all these things according to me is haram, but I don't, I don't complain and take it out. I said, okay, you want, and they earn more money by this. I said, you earn the money, I will earn the sawab. Because of your thing which is haram, people are watching my video, you get the money, I'm not complaining, I'll get the sawab. So there's no copyright. Many people do this. As far as you're concerned, brother, don't do these, uh, these activities. It's not, it's not Islamic. But you, go, you want to upload the videos, no problem. Please don't edit it. You earn money. I've got no problem. We will never, we will never red flag it. We'll never go to YouTube and say that is our video. Unless someone has altered or manipulated. My videos are copyright free because of which the viewer on my channel is less. I'm aware of that. Because we have uploaded 
only 1880 videos as of few days back 1880 videos actually when you google and see top dr zakir naik you will get at least 12 to 14 million out of which you know websites etc if you check videos 9 million that means there are 9 million videos of mine available according to google search mostly on the youtube and other social media 9 million how many have we uploaded less than 2000 that means four and a half thousand times more other people have four and a half thousand times in percentage wise 450,000 percent more so why should I object they are giving me some some are doing haram by doing certain things they are getting audience for me I get the sawab, they get the money. Some people are doing for earning but not doing haram. I have got no objection at all. So if you want to use my videos, I give you permission. Don't tamper with it, please. Keep it and see to it that the quality is good. Now most of our new videos on, on YouTube are high quality, some on high definition, some on 4K. Maintain the quality, it will be thankful. I will be thankful to you. The next question is, we have 10 minutes more. I asked from India, what is your opinion about the recent tweet from the Arab world leaders warning the right to wing Hindu fanatics to abstain from spreading Islamophobia, otherwise they will be kicked out of the country for spreading venom against Muslims. They even warned India to treat the Muslim minorities well. Well, India just like they treat Hindus in Arab countries. We saw, we even saw Prime Minister Narendra Modi tweeting soft messages towards Muslims after that furor from the Arab world. What is my view? A similar question has been asked, I'm clubbing it together, by Sayyid Hashmi from Doha, Qatar. In the present scenario, in context of Indian Muslims, a planned campaign is being implemented, ridiculing the religious profile, ridiculing and religious profiling and demeaning of Indian Muslims in India. How should Muslims tackle this? And what should, what should be a strategy? Please appreciate. Uh, uh, what should be a strategy? Appreciate your guidance. As far as what should we do in this situation when, especially in India, it's happening all over the world. There's Islamophobia, you find in the Western countries, you find everywhere. But I do agree that in India, it has reached epidemic levels. Especially after the new government came to power, that is the BJP, led by our new Prime Minister Narendra Modi, which is in power for approximately six years and when second time he came in second time when he got re-elected it has reached epidemic levels your what should we do as Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fusila chapter number 41 verse number 34 repel evil with good you may never know the per, the person who is your enemy will become your friend so if they are abusing you if they are calling you with names illogically blaming you repel evil with good you be kind to them you be good to them as far as we in india we should soften their hearts and as allah says you may never know that the enemy will become your friend and that's what i did when i was in india that's the reason the majority of the non-muslims who came for my talk the majority of the non-muslims who knew me they were my fans there were some non-muslims who even came and touched my feet which is not allowed in islam what are you doing they said no you're bhagavan ka avatar they love me, they respected me, say, say what you want to do. Some of them come and say, I've been seeing your videos for years. Tell me what I should do. I said, accept Islam. And they accepted immediately, Alhamdulillah. They love me, they respected me. There were very few who were against me. But since this new government came, they created a campaign against me and they have given a feeling like, as though majority of the non-Muslims are against me. Even in Malaysia here. Majority, where I'm staying, majority of the non-Muslims, they love me. They, when I go to the shop, they give me free non-Muslims, they don't charge me. There are yet few who are politically inclined, like in India, who for the political vote bank, they, they criticize me. Otherwise, majority of, so we should love the non-Muslims, especially in India, the Hindus and majority, care for them and try and remove the misconception. Regarding the main question, what happened in the Arab world, that there were many people who started maligning Islam, abusing the prophet, criticizing Islam, calling not. So in the last couple of weeks, Alhamdulillah, there has been a backlash 
from the people in the Middle East, mainly from Kuwait, from UAE, from Dubai, from Sharjah, from Saudi Arabia. And they came up, lawyers came up, activists came up from the loyal family. They came up and they started saying, what is this? And we know that there are more than, there are more than 10 million Indians living in the Middle East alone. More than 3 million in, in Saudi Arabia, close to 4 million in, in UAE and the other Gulf countries. And the major foreign exchange that comes in, in, in India is from the Middle East. And all the Muslim countries put together more than 50%. From the Middle East alone, 55 billion every year. More than 1 billion a month from Saudi alone. More than 1 billion a month from uh, UAE alone. And out of those people working in the Gulf countries, approximately 50% are Muslims, 50% are non-Muslims. The non-Muslims are on the higher post. Most of the Indian Muslims, they are on the lower post, few are on the higher post. The non-Muslims, most of them are on the higher post, few are on the lower post. And if, when I did a survey, when I was, when, when I was a resident earlier of Dubai, the top 100 Indians in the Middle East, the richest in the Forbes list, the top 100 richest Indians in the Gulf country, 80% were non-Muslims, 75% Hindus, and only 20% were Muslims. So when so much money that is coming in to India from the Muslim country, majority earned by the non-Muslim, that means they're living comfortably. I don't know of any single case in any of the Muslim countries or the Gulf country where a Hindu was forced to sell Allah Akbar, never. But here the Muslims are forced to say uh, many things which are against Islam, like Jai Shri Ram, etc. So the backlash came and there was a warning that if anyone is caught on the social media, the non-Muslims, mainly of, most of them were Hindus from India belonging to who are the supporters of the BJP. According to me, most of the Indians, the Hindus, they love Muslims. According to me. Even today, there's a small percentage of Hindu maybe before BJP came to power, maybe 5% were against Muslims and maybe 15% were in favor, always supported and 80% were neutral but they had no problem with the Muslims. When the BJP came to power, the percentage increased. Now I believe maybe 15% in the first election after election was 10%. Now when they won the second election, maybe 15% against, hardcore against Muslims, the Hindus and the percentage favoring now has reduced from 15 according to me maybe 5%. Fear of backlash from the government being arrested and 80% are neutral and afraid to speak. We should convey the message, remove the misconception. This backlash that came from the Gulf country, it should have come long before, but better late than never. And I agree with it that they gave the warning and many of them were arrested. They were put in jails. Many were sent back. How can you criticize the beloved prophet, speak against the Quran, the country where you're staying, which is giving you bread and butter. They are not fo forcing you to say anything to do about Islam. You are living comfortably. You are not paying an income tax. You are sending most of your earnings back home. So I am very much positive. And then one of the lawyers from Kuwait has made even a case in the Geneva, in the human rights. and. He said that anyone who finds any non-Muslim making abusive remark against the Muslim, send it to him, he will put it in the court. Very good, we appreciate it, very good. But I want, I want to give them advice a step further. Besides collecting all the non-Muslims who are speaking against Islam on the social media, though in percentage wise there may be few, let me tell you, even the non-Muslims who are against Muslims in, non -Muslim, in the Muslim countries, Gulf countries, would not be more than 10%, according to me. And speaking in the media would be just 2 or 3 percent. So this lawyer said, let's accumulate data, data bank of all the non-Muslims who are speaking against Islam. And see to it the bottom task. I would like to tell them that go a step further. I would request that you even keep a data bank of non-Muslims in India speaking against Islam. And those which are speaking are mainly the hardcore activists of the BJP government. And most of them, they are rich. And let me tell you that most of the politicians of India, they have their money stored in UAE. 
in the Gulf country, most of them. And most of them, majority those of the, of the non-Muslims who travel abroad, more than 50% they visit the Gulf country or the Muslim countries. I would suggest to that Kuwait lawyer that even collect the data of all the negative remarks and abusive of all the non-Muslims in India and keep a data bank and store it into the computer. Next time if they come to the Gulf country, whether it be Kuwait, whether it be to Saudi Arabia, whether it be to Dubai, whether it be to Indonesia, in the data bank you should be mentioned, okay, now they have abused the Prophet, which is not permitted by law, and they have abused Islam, bid them to task, have a case against them, arrest them and put them behind bar. And when you do this to five or ten people, believe me, majority of them will stop, because they travel to Muslim countries. If not majority, at least 25% will stop. Make it public that we have our data bank. Don't reveal the names. The moment they come, arrest them, take them to the court of law, give them punishment. Believe me, most of these people who are BJP Bhakt, who are spreading venom against Islam, against the Muslim, they will get scared. And my last suggestion is, let the Muslim countries make a block. The major Muslim countries, whether it be Saudi Arabia or uh, UAE, uh, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, uh, can be Nigeria, Qatar. Most of the oil that comes to India comes from Muslim countries, from from uh, Saudi Arabia, from Nigeria, from UAE. Natural gas comes from Qatar. Palm oil comes from Indonesia and Malaysia. Let's make a block and we work collectively so that if they say anything against Islam, against the Muslim, we can be a better force. So if the Muslims unite, inshallah, and put a pressure on Muslims and the other countries which are maligning Islam, inshallah, this will have a positive impact and they will stop doing this activity. The time is up. I would just like to go through the Facebook there's Haider Mohammedin who has said salams, Quratul Abdul Majid Meman, Faila Rabia, Samir Munshi, Siddiq Al Muhammad, Mahmoud Azaman, Zain Fatima, Bibi Fatima. Walikum assalam to all of you. And due to short of time, I'd like to end this session, the whole, the third session. This is the question and session. And I'd like to thank all of you. I would like to pray for all of you. And my best wishes to all of you. Please continue doing du'as for me and one of you. Be prepared. Today, on the next couple of days, you will get a personal phone call from me amongst those people who have asked questions and I have not answered to them amongst more than 70, 80,000 questions till now. You'll get a call. Don't be shocked if you hear from me. And I would like to say, Assalamu Alaikum. ورحمة الله وبركاته وآخر الدعوان الحمد لله رب العالمين